Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So we have spent the last few Wednesday nights since we began this seventh chapter, and we're dealing with uh, one time period in particular in the Jewish calendar. We're in the final year of Christ's life, and it is the last uh, Feast of the Tabernacles festival uh, that Jesus uh, will uh, be a part of in the flesh, were, uh, because we're in that final stages right here, the final uh, better than half year to go for Passover and the crucifixion and, of course, the victorious resurrection. But we're at a, a very interesting place right now in regards to what Jesus brings up right here. It is now the last day, it says, of this, of this feast. And we'll talk about the, uh, the importance of that in just a second. But if you look at your outlines, you'll see I've titled this, it's kind of a long title, but I've titled tonight's uh, teaching, Jesus' Water Analogy of the Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because what he is talking about here that I've just read to you, chapter 7, verses 37 30 through 39, is about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you why that is, of course. Um, interesting, isn't it, that this seems to be, uh, again, along with the deity of Christ and other important things, this aspect of the person of the Holy Spirit and his baptism in particular, which is really Christ's baptism, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is a central focus in Jesus' ministry. There is more um, detailed information about the person and the method uh, and uh, the means by which the Holy Spirit ministers and would minister uh, as the third person of the Godhead, if you will, to the church. There is more of that information in John's Gospel than there is in the other synoptic Gospels. We've already seen some hints of it. By the time we, and by the way, all these statements about the Holy Spirit, including tonight, prepare us for the longer teachings about the person of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. There are sections out of each of those that are emphasizing the person of the Holy Spirit. Even at the end of this gospel, well, the 20th chapter in any case, there's 21 chapters, but at the end of the 20th chapter, Jesus comes together that night, the night of his resurrection, that, that, uh, that Sunday, when he was raised, he comes together with the boys that night and it says that he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. As my Father sent me, so send I you. And uh, then it says, as, you, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, as I have been sent and I forgive sins, so I give you the authority to forgive sins as well. And that forgiving of sins has to do with the acknowledgement in regards to those who are sent. So when he breathes on them, it's an authorization. You know, they are, now, they are now filled relative to the sending aspect, and part of that sending aspect has to do with the forgiveness of sins. Now, that was not the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus had to be glorified first. And I'll show you, just like we read in verse 39 right here, that this glorification has to do with his crucifixion, his burial, and then his resurrection. Uh, uh, might as well clues, include the ascension in that because that's part of the glorification, especially when you cross-reference this with Daniel chapter 7 and the statements that are, that are there in regards to that. But this is important. Um, <clears throat> the first reference to the actual baptism of the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel is in chapter 1, uh, verses 30 through 33. And I'm going to have you slip over there and take a quick look at that. Chapter 1, verses 30 through 33. And John the Baptist is speaking, and you'll recognize this. It says, this is he, John says, this is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I didn't recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. So the point of John's baptism, water baptism, was to manifest the person of Messiah to Israel. That's one reason. 32, John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. Now he's reflecting back to what he saw at Jesus' baptism. He's using a past tense right here. So, so Jesus' baptism with 
of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son, and the Spirit coming down upon him and baptizing him for power, for the ministry. That has already taken place, and now he's reflecting back on that. So he says, I've seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven. He remained upon him. I didn't recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him. Watch now. This is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Why was that so important for God to point out to John? <clears throat> I mean, couldn't, couldn't God just as easily have said, this is the one who will bear the sins of the world away? Or this is the one who will defeat death and he will be raised? Or this is the one who will ascend into heaven? No man has ascended, you know, unto the Father, from earth to heaven, but this one will. You could have chosen a lot of different things. This is the fulfillment of all, this man is the fulfillment of all the messianic promises. But instead, God says, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So first reference to the baptism of the Holy Spirit is right here. Jesus is identified as the one who does it. It's his work. All right. Then we see a second reference to the baptism of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 3, and verse 34, John chapter 3 and verse 34, where John the author now, the Apostle John, is speaking. <clears throat> and he says, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, now watch this, for he gives the Spirit without measure. That's a reference to the baptism. He gives the Spirit without measure. Uh, the Greek is kind of interesting there because it's an idea of no holds back. You kind of get it there from the English. He gives the Spirit without measure. There is this no holding back. Um, we've already had John tell us that Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. The Father told him that. That's important. And now here, John says, uh, he is the one who gives the Spirit without measure. That's a part of the baptism. There is no holding back when it comes to the Spirit. And by the way, let me make it clear to you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, especially as it is initiated in Acts, the second chapter, on the day of Pentecost, is the, is the incept by which um, the, not only the aspect of the Spirit coming upon happens, but coming within happens and becomes our era bone, our down payment, because Paul talks about this, the, the Spirit is the down payment of your promised redemption to come. He is also our sealer. He seals us, meaning that God places his mark of ownership uh, upon us. All these things happen, bang, on the day of Pentecost, see, 40 days after Passover, and the Holy Spirit comes, and this is all the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it's not limited to that. There's more to it than that. Because in Matthew 28, verse 19, verse 20, 18, 19, and 20, Jesus tells the boys, go make disciples of all the nations. And the act of making disciples must involve the authority of baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Then he says, teaching them. And all those verbs work together. They, they coalesce together. That the teaching and the discipling it brings the baptism. And that's exactly what Peter is going to say to the crowd on the day of Pentecost when they say, men and brethren, they respond to Peter's preaching, men and brethren, what are we supposed to do? You know, he says, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When he says be baptized, he's referring to be baptized with the Holy Spirit because when the preaching takes place, they're cut to the heart. They're, they're wide open spiritually. And he says, what do we do? He says, what you need to do is what you've been told already because everything Peter just preached to them was all about repentance. So repent and be baptized. That was Peter's authoritative statement for those who repent, because you know nobody repents if they don't believe, so belief is already a given. Um, for those who believe and repent, there is the fulfilling of the Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20 scenario, where he says, make disciples, baptizing them, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've taught you to observe everything I've taught you, I will always be with you to the end of the age. Now, don't let that, the difference in the book of Acts and Matthew 28, uh, and 19 throw you when Jesus is baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead. But see, 
Uh, Colossians 2 verse 9 says all of the Godhead or the deity of the Godhead dwells in Christ in bodily form. See, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whoom, right in Christ. Everything is through Christ. All the authority is through Christ. See, God has given him a name that's above every name, okay? And it is this one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So we saw it in the first chapter, John the Baptist proclaims it. This is the one who told me, upon I, whom I see the Holy Spirit falling, he's the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Mark that. See? And then we get to John 3.34, for he whom uh, God has sent speaks the words of God. And notice the speaking of the words of God in verse 34. You all looking at it? 3.34. Notice that the speaking of the words of God is directly connected with the aspect of the Spirit is given without measure, without limitation. And it happens through the word. Well, that takes us right back to Matthew 28, 19 again. You're baptized as discipleship is taking place, as teaching is going on. That's where the spirit is given without measure. Now, thirdly, we come to our text tonight, which is actually the third place where the baptism of the Holy Spirit is spoken of again. And all this is preparatory to get us uh, to the teaching of the person of the Holy Spirit relative to Christ sending him and the Father sending him after Christ departs to baptize his church. So looking back on chapter 7 now and verse 37 and 38 and 39, let's read it again now that we have that, that information. Let's read this again. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood, cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, the Spirit's going to be given on the day of Pentecost. Not before then. Not before then. So I, I, the reason I brought up that John chapter 20 scenario right there, I think it starts at verse 22, I think is what it is, where Jesus says, you know, as the Father sent me, so send I you. He breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. Those whom sins you uh, forgive, they are forgiven. Those whom you retain, they are retained. It's a sending aspect. Um, that's very important because they still didn't have the Holy Spirit. They weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. That's not going to happen until the day of Pentecost because as we are going to see in Acts chapter 1, Jesus stresses to the guys, don't you dare leave Jerusalem until you are a receptor of the promise of the Holy Spirit that you have heard from me. And then he's going to say, remember, John baptized with water, water. You know, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will be empowered. So he presses. Now, they had already received the John chapter 20, you know, sending, breathing scenario, see? And, and that's important. That was something that the, the, the apostles needed to have, uh, that aspect of being able to, uh, uh, not on their own authority, but as people repent and believe, they, can, they are then authorized to say, your sins are forgiven. And for those who won't repent, your sins are not forgiven. And we saw some occasions in the book of Acts where Paul, in fact, had to say that. He had to say, Pfft. You know, I'm washing my hands of you, shaking my robe out. You know, I've done what I'm supposed to do. Now I'm going under the Gentiles. Guess what that means? Your sins are retained. Okay. So we've learned in chapter 1, verse 33, that number one, Christ will baptize with the Holy Spirit. We saw that in 133. Christ will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Second, we saw in 334 that Christ will give the Holy Spirit without measure. In 334, Christ will give the Holy Spirit without measure. And third now, we're seeing here in 7, verses 38 and 39, that the Spirit will flow out of the believer as living water. Now, there are so much Hebraisms in regards to this, and we'll touch on some of that, but I'm not going to take the time to do exhaust that subject uh, tonight. Also keep in mind that Jesus brought up the analogy of of living water and eternal life with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4 in verse 10 and verse 14. Verse 10 and verse 14 of John chapter 4, the woman at the well. So, 
Consider your outline, the way we're going to see how this breaks down. In verse 37, we're going to first consider the nature of the Spirit. And I've got parenthesis after that with the word drink in it. The nature of the Spirit. This aspect of drinking in the Spirit speaks to the Spirit's nature, and we'll try to make that clear. Secondly, we'll talk about, in verse 38, the location of the Spirit. And then, in parenthesis, within. The location is within. So Jesus stresses in verse 37 that there's this aspect he wants to talk about, about drinking relative to the Holy Spirit. That should remind you of of what we just got through studying in John chapter 6, starting at verse 53, when he says, he who eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood has everlasting life. And he says that for the next four verses. He brings in that analogy. And we've already discovered that this is not literal, of course. This is a figurative analogy way of, of saying belief, faith. See, eating his flesh, drinking his blood, is believing in him. Jesus carries on that same analogy still with these people right here. Then thirdly, we'll talk about the actual baptism of the Holy Spirit, where I'm calling that the coming of the Spirit, baptism, in verse 39. So let's consider verse 37. What is the nature of the Spirit, and why do I write down the word drink after that? Verse 37 of John 7. Now on the last day... Of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. All right, so from the beginning of chapter 7, we've been dealing with the Feast of Tabernacles. And you'll recall, that's an Old Testament mandatory feast, one of the three mandatory feasts. There were seven of them, but there were three that were mandatory for all the Jewish males to attend. That was mandatory. Uh, So you got Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. They are right now six months away from Passover. Pentecost will follow... 50 days after Passover, and of course the baptism with the Holy Spirit uh, will be initiated at, at that moment. But right now, we are about six months away from that. So this last great day of the feast, it says, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, uh, there, it was a seven-day feast, if you will recall, and there was, there was an eighth day connected to it. There was an eighth day, an event that was supposed to happen, kind of a wrap-up on the eighth day, and a special celebration, and you can read about that in Leviticus 23, starting at verse 36. Leviticus 23 and verse 36 for that eighth day special celebration. Now here's here's the scenario. This is why this is important, where Jesus stood and cried out what he did. What would happen on this day is that the priest would go uh, to the pool of Siloam, Siloam, Uh, connected to the Gihon Springs right there. And the priest would uh, come from the temple, go down to this pool, and he had this gold pitcher in his hand. This is something that the Jews added, by the way. Uh, What, you know, they added plenty of things during the intertestamental period. But this is something that was added, okay? God didn't command that this would be done. And this pitcher would be taken, it would be filled up from the water at the Pool of Siloam, and then that would be taken back to the temple precinct. Now, People are following him all the way down there, and they're following him all the way back, and there's singing that goes on, and there's psalm singing. And so they get back to uh, the temple proper, and they're in the court of the priests, uh, where the brass brazen altar would be. And what they would do is they would pour this water out. Some some say that there was a kind of a funnel that it would be poured into uh, the altar, and that there was a glass of wine involved with this, you know, know, maybe. But what we do know is that there was this pouring that took place, and it would be poured out upon uh, the brass altar. And while this is happening, the, the, the temple choir would be singing the Hallels behind this, and the, and the flautists would be playing behind of this, and they'd be singing portions out of Psalm 118. Portions out of Psalm 118, which gets a lot of attention during the Passover, by the way. The boys, when, they, when Jesus and the boys left the upper room, they sang this traditional hymn, which was some portion of Psalm 118. In any case, this, all the singing is going on, and all the people would follow this one priest from the Pool of Siloam all the way back, and they get as far as they could because the people couldn't enter into um, the, the, the court of, of the priest. They had to stay in the court of Israel. But everybody could see what was happening, and all the singing and festivity, and, and a lot of people. The idea behind the pouring out of the water would be asking God for a bountiful harvest, lots of rain, fruitfulness. And so some of the people would, would have citrus fruits, 
and, and other things of the other fruits of the ground with them, and they'd be waving them, and there would be the singing of the psalm going on, right? All this is happening, but you've got to keep in mind that this happens like every year. You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, and it keeps happening. And Jesus is standing there, and he's watching all this. And the text says, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood, and the better Greek would be, was standing, because it's a perfect tense form of the verb. Jesus was standing. It's a dramatic moment. And he cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Because what we got here is a dead ritual. It's a dead ritual. God, I mean, he didn't even authorize this, this aspect of the pouring out of the pitcher and things like that. And, you know, I don't want to press too too hard here, but you can imagine him looking around and some of the people, you know, it's like, wow, they do this every year, year in, year out, you know, and there's something missing that's going on here. And if you're an older Jew and you've been practicing this and you have, you know, any sort of, you know, sensibility spiritually about you at all, it's like, okay, I need a drink. You know, that kind of a thing that's going on. And so Jesus takes the opportunity. Can you imagine the gall, how he interrupts their little sacred service? And Jesus just cries out, right? Are you thirsty? Is this working for you? Is this filling that void? Or do you still feel parched inside? This is the same thing with the woman, uh, Samaritan woman at the well. But he who asks of the water that I will give him, it will be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. See, And that's what they wanted. But they didn't know how to get it. They knew the prophecies, which we're going to look at in a second here. They knew the prophecies concerning this aspect of the typology of water and the refreshingness of spiritual life that that typology would bring. Uh, to them. And it's like, where is it? Where is it? So Jesus stands there. Interesting, middle of 37, if anyone is thirsty, he says, uh, diapha'o, diapha'o, or diapsa'o. And thirsty is fine, but it carries with it the idea of longing for a thing. Longing for. Does anyone long for something more? Or is this ritual getting it for you? Or do you long for something more? Well, I'm talking to you if you're longing. If you're thirsty, if you're longing, then come to me and drink. I mean, and Jesus had been ministering, you know, for th- three years now, uh, throughout Judea, throughout the area, into Gentile uh, areas, but mostly in Judea. And, and people knew who he was, and he's there. Then come to me and drink. Um, Notice the word drink at the end. Because I'm talking about the nature of the Spirit, first point, drink. Now I press this because this idea of drinking and relative to water is full in the Old Testament background. I want to give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. You remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they ended up in two places... Uh, it talks about it in, uh, in Exodus 17, and it's over in Numbers as well. Uh, I'll give you the references later. Um, and the people are without water. They're thirsting. And they have this rock that they've been carrying with them. Remember when we did the Genesis study and we went through some of this? This rock that had been carried? This rock was the Bethel stone. Remember how I took, like, it was about a dozen scriptures, and I traced it for you. I traced it from Genesis uh, uh, when uh, when when uh, uh, Joseph first or Jacob first gets a hold of that stone, remember he's running from his brother, and he goes to that place and he calls the stone that he sets up as a monument. He calls that the house of God. That is Bethel, and that Bethel stone is handed down and it gets into Joseph's hands in Egypt and it moves into Moses's hands. Moses carries that out of Egypt and it's traveling with the people, and God tells Moses. Stand on the rock, not some rock out there in the craggy wilderness, but stand on the rock, right? Smite it, and out will come water. And of course, he does that. The rock splits open, and out comes the water. The second time he tells him to do this, he tells him, just speak to the rock. Just speak to it. And of course, Moses blows it. 
He's uptight, he's upset, and he ends up smiting him. God graciously granted the water anyway, but that's why Moses couldn't go into the promised land. He disciplined him in, in regards to that. Okay, this rock, this rock, this rock that was with the people of Israel, from which they were to drink. Remember the context here is talking about if you're thirsty, come to me and drink, because there's rivers of living water, and then 39 tells us authoritatively that what he's talking about is speaking about the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit involved in this. Now hold your spot and look at 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and look at the 4th verse. Now eh, let's do verse 1 down to 4. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4. Paul says... To the Corinthians, for I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the Red Sea. So, referencing to the people of Israel leaving Egypt, passing through the Red Sea, you know the story, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The idea being, you know, the water never touched them, by the way, folks. Um, the water was held back. So when he says baptized here, it's in the sense in which the word baptizo, the verb, has always been used historically um, uh, in regards to the history of the word. It means to change a condition, to change a condition. The idea of dipping and immersing, that showed up later in the history. But the word baptizo means to to affect something and change its condition. So they were changed into the authoritative condition under the law concerning Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Three, and all ate the same spiritual food. That would be the manna that fell from heaven. Now watch four, and all drank, drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Remember also, it's been a while, but when I took you through that account of the, the history of the Bethel Stone, I showed you how by the time we get into the historical books and references uh, in the Psalms in particular, that Christ is referred to as the rock and the stone that the builders rejected. And that's talking about the building of the temple under Solomon, and there was a stone that was there that was not quarried well, and it was rejected. I believe it was that stone. I believe it was the Bethel stone. Uh, this rock, this Bethel stone, is a reference to Christ. He is the rock upon which men will fall and be smote, upon which it will fall upon them and it will crush them. You remember Jesus speaking that way to the scribes and the Pharisees in the synoptic uh, text in particular, but notice that this spiritual rock that they drank from represented Christ. It was Christ. And they were to drink from that. Who is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit? Are you with me? Who is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit? Christ. Yeah, Christ, exactly. The baptizer with the Holy Spirit is not the Holy Spirit, is it? It's the person of Christ. All right. Now, this rock that followed them, they drank from that. And that's talking about the two times when first Moses had to smite the rock, then he was supposed to speak uh, to the rock, but water came out both times. Now, with that in mind, they were to drink from this, and his whole context here is talking about, in verse 39, as you look back, don't look back at it yet, but chapter 7, verse 39, that he's speaking about the living waters that come uh, through that person. It's about the Holy Spirit, and the aspect is drinking. And Jesus says, come to me if you're thirsty and drink. Drink like your fathers drank in the wilderness. I supplied for them in the wilderness. And Jesus carries on that analogy throughout John's Gospel. John chapter 4, drink of the water that I will give you, Samaritan woman. See. Now, with that in mind, back to 1 Corinthians, look at the 12th chapter and the 13th verse. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Watch out for the drinking aspect again. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, and you're familiar with this, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we were all made to what? Drink. We're all made to drink of the one spirit. 
drink of the Spirit. And it's this one Spirit that we're drinking from, top of 13, that says we are baptized by through the person of this Holy Spirit. So you've got, you've got, this text right here is the number one explanatory text for what Paul means by Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one baptism. And that's the baptism of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And it's drinking. We have all drunk into one spirit through this baptism. See, it's analogous. Okay, with that in mind, go back to chapter 7 of John. And now let's go to the second point. We've just discussed the nature of the Spirit, and it's the aspect of drinking, which is in line with the metaphor concerning the meaning of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, drinking. Now let's consider, secondly, the location of this Holy Spirit who baptizes us within. He is within. Verse 38, Jesus continues now. He's standing in front of the people. They've just poured out this water. Nobody's had any spiritual thirst quenching yet at all through this ceremony. He says, if anyone is thirsty, if anybody is longing, let him come to me and drink. And he's not talking about a literal drink of arrowhead water. I got this cool, you know, flat of of bottled water to give you. But it's about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. But even right then, Jesus can't give it to them right then. He hasn't been glorified yet. It's not coming for a while. I'm even going to show you how long in the text here they have to wait for this to come. But they got to come to him and be in him so that they can be baptized. Okay, now watch. He says in verse 38, He who believes in me, take your pencil, go from the word believe, connect it to the word drink at the bottom of 37. Top of 38, he who believes, connect it to the bottom of 37, drink. Same thing. It's exactly what he was talking about in chapter 6, verse 53. 54, 55, 56. He who believes in me, who drinks from me, as the scripture said, and now he quotes, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. First, John, like Matthew, um, takes a a lot of scripture truth from the Old Testament and pulls it all together under one heading and says, as the scripture says, and then he gives what appears to be a quote. You're not going to find this quote anywhere in in the Old Testament. Just like when Matthew says in his gospel, uh, at the end of the the second chapter, the scripture says, Jesus, he, will be called a Nazarene. There is no scripture that says he'll be called a Nazarene. But if you know all of the passages like out of uh, Isaiah and Zechariah, for instance, that Jesus, the Messiah, is referred to as the what? The Nazar, which means branch in Hebrew. That's a compilation of all of those passages, and that's why he says what he says. Okay, same thing right here. The scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now, innermost being, that's paraphrastic, uh, because the Greek right there is kolia, kolia, and it literally means the belly, the belly. Well, it's, it's probably not good judicious writing to say, out of your belly will flow these you know, rivers of water, because out of my belly, I don't want nothing flowing, quite frankly. You know, so it means, I think New American Standard is right, innermost being, someplace within is the idea, within, which is why I say in the second main heading here, the location of the Spirit, within. Okay, So we drink of the Holy Spirit, that's the baptism we've already seen, uh, same, same analogy. And now he is within. And from within, from within us, which is like completely unheard of from an experiential point of view, from within us will flow these rivers of living water. Now, as Jesus is saying this, these good Jewish folks who have been raised in Torah and in the prophets and in the Psalms and so on, they're, some of them have got to be thinking about things like Ezekiel 46, when Ezekiel is describing um, in his vision uh, that the waters that, uh, that are very much a part of what Jesus is talking about here, that begin to flow out of the inner part of the Holy of Holies in the, in the, in the temple, which is a reference to the church when you get into the end of Ezekiel right there. 
and they begin to flow out and they come up to the ankles and then they come up to the knees and then they come up to the waist and then pretty soon you're swimming in it and it's this giant river. And of course, John pulls that information uh, from Ezekiel 46 and the surrounding uh, context and he talks about that in Revelation 21 and 22. He talks about the trees that are by this river of the water of life. Well, he's pulling it from, from that and how that they minister, they go out these rivers of water of life, which is Jesus' baptism with the Holy Spirit, they go out and floods the world and floods the nations, you see, and gives fruitfulness to these trees. And the leaves of the tree, it says, are for the healing of the nations. That's also from Ezekiel. But I slightly digress. He says, from his innermost being, middle of 38, will flow rivers of of living water. Um, Isaiah 12 and verse 3. Isaiah 12 and verse 3. Actually, I'm going to back this up a little bit. Now, I'll give you verse 12, uh, 12, 3 real quick. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. But a, a text outside of its context is a pretext for a subtext. Now say that back to me real quick. I'm kidding. Oh, that sounds like tongues. Okay. If you go back actually to the end of chapter 11, Isaiah 11, and look at verse 16. He says, A highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up out of Egypt. So what you're about to read as you get into chapter 12 is God talking about the restoration of his ethnic people who are elect, that are dispersed among the nations, whose progeny is originally from Assyria. That refers to, that refers to the Assyrian uh, overthrow and the bondage thereof. Well, he's going to get those people. And it says at the beginning of chapter 12, verse 1, Then you will say on that day, the day that the remnant of his people come, who are out of Israel, come back. Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore... You will joyously draw water from the springs or wells of salvation. And in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. And then there's more of that, this lauding that goes on. Well, only a, only a regenerate people will do this. You know, otherwise it's not going to happen, you know, because Romans 5 is clear. There, the, men as enemies uh, to God outside of the redemptive work of Christ. But, but they would be thinking along these lines as well. In fact, if you look at... Uh, Ezekiel 36, fabulous uh, passage. Ezekiel 36, continuing this analogy of water and flowing from one's innermost being. Look at Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 22. Ezekiel 36, 22. 36, 22 of Ezekiel says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Watch now. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. And I will, watch this, this is great, I love this. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. That's the Adamic sin nature, folks. I will remove the heart of stone. Cross reference that to Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12, and Romans 6, 6, for a complete mind blow, and a complete set of freedom lies. I will remove Colossians 2, 11 and 12, Romans 6, verse 6, Ephesians uh, 2, verse 3, 
I'm giving them all to you now. Uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 4. You have been made a partaker of the divine nature. You have escaped, escaped from the corruption that's in the world through lust. You're, if, you, you, if you're a partaker of the divine nature, you're totally a partaker, a sharer, a koinonia of the divine nature. Not partially, totally. The, the Adamic fallen thing doesn't work in that combo. It's not happening. God is, Habakkuk 1, 13, God is too holy to even look on sin. You think he's going to hang with it? It's not going to happen. Okay? It's been removed. That's what being made a new creation is all about. Okay, see, now if you don't hold on to me, I'll, I'll head down that trail. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, bottom of 26, and give you a heart of flesh, 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to watch in my statutes. You'll be careful to observe my ordinances. In other words, that's just like Jeremiah 31, which is quoted in Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, that he says he will write his laws on our hearts. That's a new nature. It's not, it's not literally carving it in. It's not if you take an x-ray. Well, look at that. There's two tablets of Moses on Brian Dogan's art. Just, what is that like that? No. No. He, that causes, it's the removal of the Adamic sin nature. And now we're led by the Spirit as new creations, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Eh, not partially new, totally new. Colossians 2.10 in him you have been made complete. Golly, Burks, calm down. Back to John 7. So the location of the Spirit is within. And by the way, the New Testament uh, fulfillment of that you'll find in uh, 2 Corinthians 1.22. 2 Corinthians 1.22, where we are sealed, where he is our the Holy Spirit is our down payment, guaranteeing what is to come. 2 Corinthians 5.5 5 says the same thing. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you heard the word of the gospel, you believed and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Go ahead, Jim. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. Um, and let's not forget Romans uh, 8, verse 9. If any man does not have the Holy Spirit, he doesn't belong to Christ. So you see, you got, uh, and there's more, obviously, than, than simply that. So we've seen that the nature of the Spirit, in verse 37, is this aspect of drinking. He ties it in to the rock, I believe, that followed them relative to all of this. And then I took you to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where by one Spirit we are all baptized, Right? whether Jew or Greek, bond or free, we've all been made to drink of one spirit. That's the baptism. And he uses, there's a reason that he's using these sim, same similar words right here, because he's building something here. And then we saw in verse 38 that the location of that spirit would be within where he says, as the scripture says, from, from his kolia, his innermost being, deep inside will flow rivers of this living water, which then brings us to the third and final point which is the coming of the Spirit, the baptism. Verse 39. Now, I love this when the, when the Scripture does this, how, how it self-interprets. Don't you like that? I, I'm digging down on that big. Okay. Verse 39. But this he spoke of the Spirit. So I would take my pencil and I would put a box around the Spirit or however you like to do it and go from the word Spirit, put an arrow up to living waters. will flow rivers of living waters. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living waters. This is the Spirit. What did we read in 334 about the Spirit? That Jesus gives the Spirit without measure. No limitations. That's the baptism. He's not chintzing out of it. He's not parceling out going, well, I've only got so much of the Holy Spirit left, so <clears throat> there's just a little bit. That's all I can give you right now. i got all these other people. i got to baptize the Holy Spirit. Here, <clears throat> here's a drop. It isn't that way at all. See, It's the immensity of God, the doctrine of the immensity of God, his hugeness beyond, beyond understanding, beyond comprehension. And we can't. You know? So we came up with this word, immense. <laughs> it's bigger beyond big, okay? In all ways, spatial and non-spatial. This he spoke, verse 39, of the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. Those who believed in him were 
to receive. Actually, it's imelo labanen. Imelo labanen. So we've got the form of the word here, mellow, which can be translated as either certainty, a word of certainty, or about to. And uh, the only way we can translate mellow as about to is if what is happening in the verb that follows the word mellow. I, I know, but, but I'm doing it to you anyway. Elders cannot. Think about it. The rule is, when mellow comes up in a text, it is translated as about to only if it is followed in the Greek text by a verb in what kind of a mood? That's a tense. That's okay. You stuck it out there, man. I respect that. That's all right. Thank you, brother. Uh, you're close. And that is a mood. The, that is a mood. It's the, um, it's the infinitive mood, okay? Infinitive mood. I know that's like, okay, when am I ever going to need that? <laughs> <clears throat> I need it all the time, and so do you, by the way. Oh, and by the way, um, you know, there is a, uh, yet again, there is a, uh, I understand that the, the so-called Preterist Study Bible is available, and um, I think it's being printed. Um, I spoke to the managing editor of that thing some months back because I was concerned about the way that they said on their site how they were going to handle the word mellow. And it was going to be an about-to translation every time. I said, please just let me let me share something with you here. They didn't ask for my help. So, you know, I'm not going to just stick my stuff in there. Well, I will to a degree. But um, so I, I gave him the stuff, and I, I gave him some references and, and also gave him the name of another guy uh, who I know has this down that I think he'll listen to more than me because, you know, I'm not full preterist. You know, I'm preterist, but I'm not like them, full preterist. And so I'm kind of like, <laughs> got enemies here, you got enemies there. Um, and so we'll see what happens. You know, but as of last time I checked, the plan was is that this is going to be translated as about to every time. And, and the reason that that's an important thing to talk about is because um, if that's what's going to happen, and I don't know that it is, but that's my last understanding. If it was to happen, this thing is going to be a joke. No scholar in, in Christendom is going to take this thing seriously because it's clearly wrong. It's not following the rules of Greek grammar. But they're not using any scholars um, for this work, and uh, um, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, but people want to have what they want to have. and So we'll see. You know, I'm sure there'll be some good things about it, but in any case, the reason I bring it up is because here we're dealing with the word mellow right here with a verb uh, in the infinitive. And so really the way this needs to be interpreted is he spoke of the Spirit uh, whom those who believed in him were what? What do you think? Yeah, about to receive. That's correct. Say what? You mean, you mean when he says those who believed in him were about to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, you mean like right then about to? Well, no, because we already talked about that, didn't we? We've got some time here to go. Remember back in verse 35. Remember how the important fe feature of mellow was in verse 35. The Jews then said to one another, better, where is he uh, intend to go or better about to go? Where is he about to go? To the dispersion among the Greeks, so on. What is the statement, so on and so forth. Where is he about to go? Well, you remember, he says that in verse 33, for a little while longer I'm with you. Now, just a little while I'm with you until then I go to him who sent me. Well, it's Feast of the Tabernacles, right? Well, when he goes, it will be via the cross, and that will be Passover, and that's six months from that this moment that he's speaking. It's six months. Okay? So, Mello could be used in reference to something that's six months away. Here's something I didn't tell you last week. Mellow is not used in elongation of time, is not used any longer than a 40-year period. It stops at 40. 
It doesn't go past that. Mellow's never used past that, but it's used within that. So when Jesus speaks about the nearness and the about to ness, and Paul talks about the about to ness of the second coming, he's within a 40 year paradigm of that, and that is perfectly acceptable according to the writing of the Holy Spirit through one of these writers here. Because they, that's the Holy Spirit through the inspired writers that gets to define the, the time text of Mello. And here you have a case where it's six months. Now when we get down into verse 39, he spoke of the Spirit whom those who believed in him were about to receive. But the Spirit's not coming till Pentecost, right? That's seven and a half months from this point. So mellow, once again, can be used in a seven and a half month period. Those who believed in him were about to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. All right, what does the glorified mean? You, you tell me. That's a good answer. You, you basically, somebody else talk. What, what else? That's a good answer, but give me. Properly. Yeah, I, I need details. What, is, what does it mean? What does this text mean? Because Jesus was not yet glorified. What is the glorified? Yep. Mm hmm. And? Yep. The witness? The, the witnesses of those who witness his resurrection. Okay? Let's go in reverse. Let's back it up a little bit more. Showing himself to the disciples. Now let's go backwards. Since then. Before then, excuse me. Okay. What? The cross. The cross. Now why am I saying that? Why am, I, why am I limiting that to that? Because the word glorified is used to describe a certain something. And that certain something, yeah, put your arm down, brother. That, that certain something, you can say it in a second. That certain something is back in chapter 12, verses 23 through 33. 12, 23 through 33. You'll remember this, the Greeks had just come to Jesus. It's Passover week now. And Jesus answers them saying, the hour for the, has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 12.23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now watch, what does he mean by, he interprets. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, hates his life. Uh, in this world will keep it to eternal life if any man serves me, so on and so forth. Goes all the way down. He says, 27, now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but it's for this purpose I came. What purpose? To die. The seed is going into the ground and is going to die. And then he says, Father, glorify your name. A voice comes out of heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. 32, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate what kind of death he was to die. And so clearly the idea of glorification uh, hooked up with the cross, his death, is what is in view. So so what at the end of verse 39 of chapter 7, 739, right at the end under glorified, you should write 12, chapter 12, verse 23 through 33. 12, 23 through through 33, because that's immediate uh, textual explanatory information right there. So the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, once he is glorified, once he is glorified, something happens. It happens 40 days, excuse me, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. Now, Let's finish up with this. Acts, the first chapter. I mentioned this at the beginning. Acts, the first chapter. Now watch this. Jesus is about to ascend. He ascends on the 40th day after his resurrection. Pentecost is 
50 days from Passover, which is his resurrection. That means at this point in Acts chapter 1, we've got another 10 days before the Holy Spirit is about to come. Acts 1, verse 4 Gathering them together, that is Jesus gathering the boys together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, I have that underlined by the way, which he said, you have heard from me, that would be at least John 14, 15, and 16, for, so he's going to say what the promise is now from the Father, for, explanation, verse 5, for, John baptized with water, yeah, for what purpose? Mm, that's one. What does John 1 say? For the purpose of, John the Baptist said, I came baptizing with water too. Bingo. Thank you, Brian. Manifest Messiah unto Israel, right? So John baptizes with water for the purpose of manifesting, but you, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So they're going to drink of the one spirit. They're going to actually drink of the rock that followed Israel in the wilderness. Now, it's and John 3.34, it's going to be a drink without measure. He gives the Spirit without measure. And so he quotes here from John the Baptist. Jesus says, I'm baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Then they ask, they get off track. Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Not for you to know. Verse 8, but you will receive power. So the baptism is the promise, which is the power. Power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, with the result being, you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem. That's the immediate location. Samaria, that's up to the north, to the uttermost or remotest part of the earth. So worldwide, all right? So now chapter 2, verse 1, ready? Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when the day of Pentecost had come, uh, was being fulfilled, actually is what the Greek says, When the day of Pentecost was actually being fulfilled, this is the fulfillment of Pentecost. It's probably one of the only passages that tells you directly that a certain event, um, uh, in this case, the coming of the Holy Spirit, is actually foretold by a Old Testament festival day. In this case, it was Pentecost, and now it's actually being fulfilled. Okay, They were all together in one place, that is, the boys and other followers, about 120 of them were in the upper room, Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. One-time occurrence, by the way. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. One-time occurrence, by the way. Here we go, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Bang! This is what Jesus told them to stay in Jerusalem for. This is what he told them is, don't leave Jerusalem. Stay right here because it's going to happen here. And you're all going to need to be together in one place. You're going to drink of one spirit. See? You're going to drink of that rock. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Look at 37, verse 37. Acts 2, verse 37. Peter just got through preaching now to the crowds that gathered, and now he's drilling it home. Verse 37. Now when they, that is the Jews out of all the nations in the Roman Empire, had heard this, Peter's preaching, they, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? See, this is the result of the power of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. See, the, this is why I said to you at the beginning, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is inclusive of all these things. It's power from on high. It places you into the body of Christ. That's the baptism. See, He, he comes in and He seals you and is your down payment before the Father, and the sealing being, you know, you're owned, you're owned by God the Father. It is all these things. See? And it all happened on the day of Pentecost. So Peter says, Peter says to them, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, are you reading that right? Are you reading that in accordance with Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20? Go, he, he says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. Okay. Now, what shall we do? Well, clearly, if they want to know what to do, they're in a state of faith. Nobody responds, and, and, and you know, after hearing Peter preach, 
and he's preaching a repentant sermon, nobody responds with, what shall we do, unless they're believing what Peter just said. So Peter says, repent. Because in Luke 24, verse 44, Jesus says, stay in Jerusalem and preach repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. Sometimes people get upset by this because how come he didn't repeat, preach faith or preach, you know. It's implied, it's implicit within repentance. Nobody repented, repents over something they don't believe. See, So it goes before. So he says, repent and each of you be baptized. Now he's commanding it now. Each of you be baptized, just like Jesus told him in Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. He said, go make these disciples, baptizing them. Here it comes. He says, repent and be baptized. He's commanding it. In the name of Jesus Christ, no need to say name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9. And what happens when you are baptized in the name of Jesus? It is for the purpose of the forgiveness of your sins. I'm not going to, eh, I could do this for you, but I'll, I'll do it quick. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, I won't give you the details, but I will say this. Grammatically, the gift of the person of the Holy Spirit is the means by which your sins are forgiven. Grammatically. Because the word gift, the word gift right here, uh, a noun in the feminine. Sins is a noun in the feminine. Forgiveness is a noun in the feminine. And so for nouns to point back to one another... Um, they have to share the same gender and number. And each one of these do. They're hooked together in the Greek text. So when one is baptized, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, for by one spirit you are baptized into what? Thank you, honey. Into one body, <laughs> into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've all been made to drink of the one spirit. Well, when he baptizes you, you're forgiven. He does the forgiving. You mean I didn't have to get down and grovel all over the ground kind of a thing? But you see, this is the aspect of God regenerating and then justifying you and sanctifying you and placing you into the body of Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah? Quick question here. Is that and there? Is that day or is that the Greek? Is that Kai? Which, which, which conjunction are you talking about? Are you in 38? Hey man, anybody can leave anytime they want. Oh, we love you, Doc. <laughs> uh, repent. Repent and be baptized. It's Kai, baptistato. Each of you, ikastos umon, epi tu onomata, upon the name, Isu Christu, of Jesus Christ, resulting in ace afisin. Uh, forgiveness, ton armaton umon of the sins of you, kai and limfeste, you will all receive, teen dorian, the gift, now by the way, forgiveness, gift, promise, all nouns in the feminine, you will receive the gift of uh, tu agio numatos, of the Holy Spirit. So what did you want to know? If they were just kai's? Yeah. yeah, they're all conjunctions. Right, if that was explaining, if that could be under Connecting. Okay. Connecting. They're connecting. Legitimately, they're connecting. Okay. Yeah. So, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise. The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit is for you and your children. Now, look at 41, and I'll stop. 41. So then, those who received his word were what? Clearly, they took him down to some stream or something, or they got some water or something like that. No, see, it's the word that then baptizes. See? So they who received his word were baptized right then, and that day they were at about 3,000 souls. And of course, like it says in my, my book that I'm still out there with, taking my time with, where's the water? 
Where is the water? Why do people think that that's water? Why do they do that? You see, it just gets in the way, and uh, it takes away from what God is actually saying uh, for us. And that's how it works throughout the rest of the book of Acts. You'll see it throughout the book of Acts, um, under Peter's preaching, but especially under Paul's preaching. They they heard the word, they believed, they were baptized, believed, baptized, believed, baptized, believed, and there's no water anywhere. Nothing. Why? Because to do so would be to take from the Lord Jesus his power and the big deal of his baptism, John baptized with water. So what? No, really. Relative to the eternal scheme of things, so what? That had a purpose, but there's nothing eternal about it. There's nothing of Christ about it. John baptized with water. Okay. Okay. But he is coming whose shoelaces I can't even unlatch. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so that's what takes place. So when you look at a text like John 7, verse 37 through 39, Jesus' water analogy of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, once again this subject comes up. And he cries out to these people in the midst of their, their religious thing, pouring out this water, right? And Jesus just stands and cries, If anybody's thirsty, longing, come to me and drink. He who believes, drinking, he who believes in me, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And it's like, that's what we want, the people would be saying. That's what we want, but this spake he of the Spirit who was not yet given because Jesus was not yet crucified, glorified. But once he is, here it comes. So you guys stay in Jerusalem. No long trips, no vacations, none of the, no trips down to Texas or anything like that. You just stay in Jerusalem. <laughs> I had to say something. I mean, it's just too good. Stay in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And then here it comes, man, a rushing mighty wind. They're all baptized. They're placed into the body of Christ. They're sealed with the Holy Spirit. They, the Holy Spirit is their down payment. Oh, they're empowered. They're witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, the uttermost parts of the world, all because Jesus is the baptizer. Just keep that water away from me. Are you kidding me? That waters down the truth of what the Scriptures are saying. Okay, enough of that. Lord, we just give you thanks and praise for all you showed us tonight. Thank you, Lord God, that the Holy Spirit will give us recall to these things, and as we, we think about them, maybe tomorrow or the next day, you will be good and gracious to us in bringing these things back to our mind and giving us further illumination in regards to this subject. Thank you so much, Lord, for all these things. And uh, we just praise you, Lord God, for your hand that is upon each one of us as we Go on our way home, Lord God. Yeah.